2011, there was a powerful earthquake and tsunami in Japan that led to knocking off the cooling systems in Fukushima nuclear plant, causing radiation leak. In the wake of this incident, Koyu Abe, a monk with some of his volunteers at the nearby Joenji Temple, planted 200,000 sunflowers. Sunflowers are known to remove radiation at a volume no other technology can. This image stuck with me for a very long time. I was thinking, we think of plants as passive creatures and food, but they are so much more. Some years later, when I was in the US at MIT, I heard about this news report when lead had contaminated in Flint River in Michigan. By the time this contamination was detected, it had proven to be too late. What do we see when we see water bodies and rivers? We see plants, we see trees. And to me, they are the front line of such detection. Inspired by this, I created carbon nanotube-based sensors that can detect heavy metals, in this case, lead. We inject these nanosensors inside the leaf of a plant, and they stay within the intercellular space. When the plants absorb water, they also absorb any impurities. These impurities, when they come in contact with these sensors, these sensors that are normally glowing will then turn off, letting you know that there is toxicity in the water. This is electricity free, depending on the real time uptake of water from the plant. And imagine you watering your house plant and it being able to tell you by glowing or not that the water in your home or the water in your schools has quality issues. We think of plants as passive, but they are again so much more. Here's a very, very different example. Have you ever heard of a living bridge? In the eastern region of India, in Meghalaya, the local communities took the aerial roots of trees and they intertwined them together to create living bridges. These bridges have lasted for more than 500 years, much longer than any of the concrete structures we have had. This is because they are self-powering, self-repairing, and self-fabricating the best kind of properties that we need in our technologies and in our electronics and in our built environments. And inspired by this, I built these little robots that stick on a sunflower plant. Sunflower grows up by four inches per week and the robot moves up by that amount slowly as well. However, in the span of few weeks, the robot with its encoded programs turns the lights on and off and automatically shapes the plants into different patterns that have been pre-programmed, a combination of organic growth and pre-programmed growth. We were able to do morphing, bending, curving, you know, all sorts of things, and we recently published this in a computational design conference for architecture. But I want to paint a picture for you. Think about these robots in a forest growing structural frameworks with bamboo over a long period of time. What if we were able to also grow furniture in greenhouses instead of just food? Why don't we do that already? Now, let me ask you this. What do you see when you see a plant like this? To a biologist, this might be a root system with a vasculature, and to someone else, like an Ayurvedic expert, these are medicines. But when I see plants, I see the electrochemical signals inside them that are so similar to what goes on in our own bodies and in our electrical circuits, the way they sense, the way they exchange information, and the way they respond. We often forget the livingness of these organisms around us. In one of the works, I took a plant, took lamps and I put them in either direction of these robots, and then I turned the lamps on. The lamps trigger the natural signals in the plants, which then triggers the robots. And here's what happens. The plant follows the light. This is a plant driving a robot, not a robot driving a plant.
There are several examples of hybrids in my work. Nanowires that grow inside the plants that may power the future interactions that we do. Plants that may act as soft notification interfaces in our houses and in our offices. But I am thinking about these hybrids in a way that they may inform our future technologies. My work is often found in botanical gardens and in cultural centers where people engage with nature. And I hope we all together ask, why is technology so separate from nature? Most of our materials today in technology are synthetic, mined, non-organic, non-biodegradable. Why don't we build organic electronics? If we peel away all the layers of technology that we have and start with a fresh new imagination, what does organic technology look like? I grew up in Punjab, and we all know the story there with technology that led to green revolution. But my question to you today is, where is the green revolution of electronics? After you step out today, I would like you to observe a plant. And hopefully what you see is not just food or decor. Hopefully what you see is potentials of new technologies. Thank you.